to worship. We are so excited you have joined us in person or online. Would you take a moment and complete the attendance pads that are in the pews? Also in the pews uh, and the attendance pad is a prayer request. If you have a prayer request, we invite you to do that as well. Let us now continue in worship. Please stand as you are able and join me for the call to worship. The Lord is sovereign. Let the people tremble in awe. God is throne upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion and is high above all the peoples. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship Yahweh upon the holy mountain. Amen. Let us pray. God of glory and mercy, before his death and shame, your son went to the mountaintop and you revealed his life and glory. Where prophets witnessed to him, you proclaimed him your son, but he returned to die among us. Help us face evil with courage, knowing that all things, even death, are subject to your transforming power. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. This is now our opportunity to pass the peace and for you to greet your neighbors.
My name is Samuel Macias, and one of the things we do as community of faith is our chairs our beliefs together. The affirmation is the Apostles' Creed, and it's on page 881 in the hymnal. Please join me now in the affirmation. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come down for our time together. Kids, come join me. I love it when my friends show me your shoes. That's wonderful. <clears throat> well, good morning. I want to talk about a time when God came down from the mountain. But before that, you may have noticed something a little different about me today. Am I going to notice my shirt? Yes. What's on my shirt? Name tags. Lots of name tags, different kinds of name tags, because there's different parts of me, and different people call me different things. You know, the first time I ever had the idea of that someone being called something different was my grandmother, Nana, and someone had the audacity to call her Mary. And I'm like, no, 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 no. She's Nana. That's her name. And I was really confused by that. But then throughout life, I got all kinds of different names. Like, well, what's that one say? Mark. Mark. That's, that's my name. That's my first name. But almost no one calls me that anymore unless I'm in trouble. <laughs> what does that one say? Mr. Mark, yeah, that's what all the kids call me. And do you know, I got that nickname. I used to be the preschool music teacher here, and the first kids to ever come to my class were two-year-olds, and they said, hi, I'm Mr. Mark. <laughs> and it stuck, and I, yeah, and I love it. Um, what does that one say? Baby boy. baby boy, I got a text from my mom two days ago, and she just said, I'm just checking to see how my baby boy's doing. I like that one. That made me feel good. Yeah, that's silly, right? I'm 52. I still like being called baby boy. Um, what does that one say? Bubba. Bubba. My best friend calls me Bubba. What does that one say? Sweetie. Sweetie. Sometimes Miss Nina calls me Sweetie, but <laughs> if I'm messing up, she calls me Mark. And what does that one say? Burroughs. That's what my coach in high school called me. But look, at least he remembered my name. So that says, Burris, get in there. It was usually, again, at the very end of the game, we were either way ahead or way behind. Well, Jesus has a lot of names, too. And Jesus' friends, the disciples, and disciples is another name for a student. So his friends, who were his students, the disciples, knew him by lots of names. He was a teacher. He was a friend. He was a healer. 
And then something amazing happened. He, and he took some of his friends up to the mountain, Peter, James, and John. They went up to a mountain, and mountains are often, especially in the Old Testament, where people would talk to God. Moses did that when he went to go hear from the burning, God from the burning bush, and God gave him a special message. Later, Moses goes up to a mountain again to get the, how many commandments were there? I'm trying to remember. How many? Do you remember? Ten. Very good. Yeah, the Ten Commandments. Elijah, one of God's great prophets, went up to a mountain one time to hear the voice of God, the still, quiet voice of God. So this time, Jesus is going up the mountain, but he takes some of his friends with him. And this is, we're celebrating a special day today called Transfiguration Sunday. Everybody say, Transfiguration Sunday. And this is a special Sunday in the life of Jesus. You know, we had those special Sundays too. We had one last week, confirmation, when our sixth graders were all confirmed as members of the church. Later on, there's going to be third grade Bible presentation, where if you're, if you're a third grader, you're going to get your very own Bible. Well, Jesus had those too, those big stepping stone, those big touchstone moments in his life. One of those was his baptism, and one of those was transfiguration. Sunday, and it's a special day. And, you know, we talk about what, what Jesus looked like and everything that happened to Jesus, and all his friends are like, wow. But we sometimes think about Jesus changing. What I like to think of it is is a day where his friends actually saw the true Jesus for the very first time. More than just a teacher, more than just a friend, more than just a healer, my favorite name for Jesus ever, one of his nicknames, one of his name tags, you want to know what it is? Emmanuel. Say Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And names have very special meanings, and Emmanuel means God with us. Not just God thinking about us, not just God making us and then walking away, but God with us, and God with us in the person of Jesus. And in all those Old Testament stories, God would talk to God's prophets and those prophets would come down. But this time, when Jesus came down that mountain with his friends, God was coming down the mountain too and saying, you don't have to be on a mountaintop to see me. I'm right here. I am God with you. I'm God with skin on. In the name of Jesus, in the name Emmanuel. This is a special day, and I'm really glad I'm getting to spend it with you. If you want to spend more of the day with me, if you'll come right to that door right there. reader. Our lessons today come from Mark 8 um, verses 27 through 30 as well as Mark chapter 9 verses 2 through 8. Mark 8 27 through 30. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi and on the way he asked his disciples who do you say I am? And they answered him John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Mark 9, 2 through 8, the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on the earth could brighten them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were all ter terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, 
the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Thank God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kim. Before we consider today's scripture reading and today's message, I want to share words of gratitude and appreciation, particularly to all the musicians we have with us today, not only to our regular choir and our regular worship leaders, but I want to thank Arlene, who's taking a rest. She's hiding behind there, but Arlene's filling in for Peggy, who's on the women's retreat as our guest organist. I also want to say thank you to everyone with the orchestra this morning. It adds so much. I really appreciate y'all being here. Appreciate everyone and all that you do to make worship possible on a Sunday morning. People who are serving with the tech team, with children, with youth all over the church. Thank you so much. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm the senior pastor here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. And ever since the beginning of the new year, we've been in a season called Epiphany. And our scripture readings from the Gospel of Mark have been regularly showing Jesus revealing more and more, not only to his disciples, but to the communities that surround his ministry, who he is and what he's capable of doing. Jesus has shown that he has power to heal people from illnesses. He has power to drive out unclean spirits that are torturing people. He has power to calm storms. He has power over the boundaries of life and death itself. And all of these things are happening and building one question over and over and over again in the hearts and the minds of the people who are not only seeing him, but even the ones who are following him most closely. And that question is, who is this guy? I mean, who is he? How is he doing this? By what power? By what authority? By by what mechanism? This doesn't happen. Who is this person? In today's scripture reading, Jesus turns to those followers, and he asks them point blank, who do people say that I am? Jesus continues to teach, to reveal, to proclaim, and it's time for them to better understand who Jesus is. So he asks them, who do you say that I am? I was in a seminary class one day about five years ago, and I'll never forget, I had a brilliant professor, incredibly engaging, but a little scatterbrained, and sometimes it would be hard to follow exactly what she was saying. And I remember taking notes and then kind of cluing back into where she had picked up the sentence, and she said, and of course, that, by the way, is the key to life, not only present, but life eternal, and getting that question right is the most important thing you'll ever do in your life. So moving on. And I remember going, excuse me, I'm sorry, can we go back to the meaning of life real quick? I was taking notes. I missed it. I'm sorry, what is it that's the most important question that you can ever ask or be answered? And she said, oh, the question is, who is Jesus to you? Who do you say Jesus is? That's the most important question of your life. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter your background, no matter your profession, your wealth, your relationships, everything comes out. Who do you say Jesus is? I never thought about it being put that way, but that's the truth, isn't it? Every single one of us needs to say for ourselves who we think Jesus is. Nobody else can do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. Your faithful friend can't do it for you. The pastor of your church can't answer for you. Your grandmama can't answer for you. At some point, you need to answer for yourself. This is who I think Jesus is. And most importantly, when you do, it will then ask something of you in return. It's amazing. Even people that have very little interest in organized religion or faith of any kind tend to have an incredibly positive perspective of Jesus. His vision of justice, his humility, his pursuit of righteousness, his constant generosity and compassion is inspiring to all people everywhere. So even people from no faith background will say, well, Jesus is obviously an incredible teacher of how to live life and be a good person. Well, the question is then, well, are you doing it? Are you following him? Are you pursuing him? Are you living that same life of justice, generosity, compassion, and humility? People will say that he's much more, though. People will say, I mean, he's a unique prophet, someone with a unique understanding of the nature of God. Well, okay, then are you following his model? Are you praying in the way that he taught you to pray? Are you living a relationship with God that he modeled? But if you're in a Christian church, I mean, if you're here for worship on a Sunday morning, 
Well, then your proclamation is probably so much more than just he's a teacher or a preacher or a prophet or a king. But like Peter, you say he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is God with us. Well, then what does that ask of you then? When Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? People give different examples. Some people say you're John the Baptist, his disciples say. He had been killed by King Herod, but maybe in you he somehow survived in your miracle work and your work of leading people towards repentance. Maybe that's a continuation of his ministry. Some say you're Elijah, the disciples say. We've been waiting for Elijah's return. He ascended bodily into heaven hundreds of years ago. We've anticipated him coming back. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're Elijah here to continue his ministry and work left off so long ago. Maybe you're another in the line of prophets, people have been saying. Our people have been blessed by God over and over again with prophets. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Obadiah. We're always looking for another Obadiah. (laughs) Peter is the stand-in for us in this story. You're the Messiah that he says. And Jesus confirms that he's right. But Messiah by itself isn't a full answer. There needs to be more to it because Messiah isn't just a title. Messiah in Hebrew means anointed one. And an anointing is a gift of God and a work of God to do. So the question is, a Messiah for what? Anointed for what? To do what? To be what? And for whom? That's where Jesus begins to teach more. This scripture continues. Jesus tells Peter and the rest of his disciples that part of being Messiah, part of my work is to be rejected, to suffer and to die, and three days later to be raised again. And Peter is a great assistant. He's someone who helps, stay, uh, helps things stay on track. And he actually pulls Jesus aside from the middle of this teaching. Jesus pulls Peter aside and goes, Jesus, that sounds crazy. Aixne on the F day, it's really bumming all of your followers out. Peter tells Jesus, stop saying that. That's not what happens to a Messiah, right? A Messiah is victorious. A Messiah conquers. A Messiah leads people into a new and better place than they've ever been before. That's what a Messiah does. A Messiah wins. A Messiah makes us greater than we've ever imagined. That's who a Messiah is. Peter has so much left to learn. We have so much left to learn about who a Messiah is. Jesus says the pathway of a Messiah is through the cross, not just for me, for everyone who follows as well. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain. And like Mr. Mark said in the children's moment, in the Bible, up the mountain is where you go to meet God. Up a mountain is where you go to receive commandments. Up the mountain is where you go to see the glory that God has to reveal to you. Up the mountain is where you go to hear God's prophetic word. So they go up the mountain and they see something they've never expected to see before. Jesus shows them who he really is. It's in that moment of teaching what Messiah is that Jesus shows that Messiah itself is something more than they've ever imagined. Yes, he's human, but he's also the perfection that humanity has always been striving for and never able to reach. And yes, he's a prophet, but he's not just a word from God. He's the word of God. He is not just God's presence. He is God's glory made possible for them. And In this moment, he begins to see just a reflection of the fullness of who Jesus actually is, and he's overwhelmed. Peter sees that not only is Jesus this Messiah, anointed one of God, but he's a continuation of the work of restoring, redeeming, and reconciling that God has been up to for generations. He is having a mountaintop moment, Peter is, here with Jesus. And he wants nothing more than to memorialize it forever. This is obviously what we've all been waiting for, 
Peter thinks. This is the glory of God revealed. This is the true nature of God for us to understand. This is the fullness of what the entire human project has been leading to forever. I imagine if Mark was sitting behind him, he would say, Mark, you can stop writing. This is the end of the gospel, and it's incredible. In that moment, Peter wants to encapsulate and memorialize this vision forever so that from this moment going forward, people can always understand who the Messiah was and what he came to make possible. But this is the key point of what Jesus was showing Peter. This is the key point of the sermon. This is the key point of the message. And this is the key point of proclaiming that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God, in your life, just like in Peter's life. Following me as Messiah, Jesus said, is not about being with me on the mountaintop. It's about following me back down. His entire life, Peter and everyone he's ever known and the people of Israel have wanted nothing more than to climb the metamorphical, metamor metaphorical mountaintop to finally see the true glory of God and to dwell with God there. Peter finally gets a chance to do it, finally sees the Messiah for whom he is, and he thinks the story is over. But the most important part of being Messiah, Jesus shows him, is is heading down the mountain because that's who your God is, not a distant God, not a disinterested God, not a God so holy that God refuses to get involved. God is a God who walks down the mountain to you. And following me means you do too. Sometimes, as a person who proclaims that Jesus is my Messiah, is my God, I have to tell you, I really want to leave out that part of the story. Sometimes more than anything else, what I want to do is climb up the mountain with beautiful worship. I want to climb up the mountain with deep prayer and connection. I want to climb up the mountain in my spirit and meet the glory of Jesus Messiah and get away from this world and its ugliness and get away from this world and its violence and get away from this world and its greed and get away from this world and its seemingly unfixable problems. But following Christ is following the Messiah who says, pick up your cross and follow me back down because that's where the people who need us are. That day, Peter learns who Jesus really is and begins to understand where following him will take Peter. And today is the day where we begin to understand, too. Let's pray. Great and loving God, great are you and greatly to be praised. Lord, on that mountainside moments years ago, Peter, like us, wanted so badly to just stay and dwell in that moment, dwell in that place, memorialize that time, that revelation, that gift of understanding, to let that be the culmination of our faith and our life in you. On that day, Lord, Jesus showed Peter that a journey of following Christ the Messiah means picking up our cross and heading back down the mountain. So Lord, as we step back amongst our people who need your life and your love, may the, Christ, may the grace and power of Christ sustain us forever. Amen. Friends, I'm Mike Marshall, one of your pastors, and let me remind you of some of the ways that we can prepare ourselves for the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. First of all, I want to remind you that if you're seated on the main level, our ushers will be uh, directing you to come forward, beginning with those in the back and then working toward the front rows. For you in the balcony, there will be stations provided for you up there. 
Uh, when you come on the main level, when you come to the rail, we invite you to open your hands like this so that a server can give you a piece of bread. You also will be given a small uh, cup of non-alcoholic grape juice. And then once you've uh, had the cup, we want to remind you that there are receptacles on both sides. And as you return to your seat, if you place the cup in there, that would be wonderful. Uh, we have gluten-free options, both on the main level and in the balcony. And if any of you would like to be served in your seat, simply raise your hand at the right time, and one of our ushers will make sure that a server comes to you. So with that in mind, hear this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. The United Methodist table is open to all, and all are welcome to take communion. Let's now join together in our confession and pardon. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thank to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, O God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he was to give himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks over the bread, broke it, and passed it, and said, Take all of you and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it, and passed it, and said, Take all of you and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen as I invite forward those who will be assisting with the serving of communion to prepare for the giving of the sacrifice, I invite all of you to join me now as the forgiven children of God in the words that Christ taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
The table is set, the meal is ready. Now, as the ushers release you, please come forward and be fed.
We invite our ushers to come forth as we spotlight our ministry this morning. We have an opportunity in the valley to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I want to tell you about two opportunities for Cowtown Marathon. We have been the church selected for the 545 worship service. And our senior pastor, Lance Marshall, will be preaching at 5.45 a.m. Oh, yeah. See you all there? <laughs> and then at 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, we need volunteers for our Cowtown, Cowtown Marathon Fluid Station on 5th and Houston. We invite you to become a, a part of that participation uh, over on 5th and Houston. Now let us pray. Thank you for the gifts we give back to you, God. Bless both gift and giver. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
benediction. If you have any questions to get connected or need help to finding something, there are people in front of the sanctuary. Our friend Angie is right there. She will help you if you have any questions how to get connected or about uh, looking for a small group, Sunday school class, Bible study, or willing to participate in volunteering. Just go with uh, my friend Angie, and she will answer the questions about that, about membership process or anything about life at First United. Feel free to ask her. Our volunteers will love to help. And if you are a guest, do we have a gift for them. Also, we have a gift for you if you are visiting us. So thank you for that. And also, yes, uh, if, oh, we can have a moment of prayer. You can be uh, the care team that will pray for you. So please join me. I have a moment of prayer for you if you are able. Thank you. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.